Um, welcome everybody to the next session. What is this for, I guess, for our fall series. Um, I'm Andrew Chignell, I'm the current president of the NAX and very happy to welcome our speakers today. This is part of what we call the VNAX Kant and blank series. Um, and that doesn't just mean that anything can fill in the blank. So the idea behind this series is that there are certain kinds of concepts and themes that are not typically sort of associated with Kant or not your average, it's not like Kant and the transcendental deduction or something like that, um, but rather something that's sort of striking, like, oh, this is new, does Kant have something to say about this or what, what would Kant say about this? Um, so this is part of that series, um, but it's actually called Kant on, so Kant and Kant on structural domination, and this was a proposed series by the participants, and we're going to do it in the kind of standard one hour, you know, one hour session. So talk a little bit of a Q and A, and then we'll take a break and then another talk and Q and A. Um, without further ado, I will introduce our first speaker who is Rafiq Hassan from Amherst College, speaking on poverty and structural injustice in and beyond Kant's theory of right. Oh, one more thing before Rafiq takes over. We're gonna, we are recording this as you can see, we do this for the sake of the speakers so that they can listen to it later if they want to. If we post it with their permission, we won't include the Q&A or any sort of um, recordings of the audience. So you don't have to feel like you're on display for the internet at the moment. Okay, Rafiq, take it away. Great, thanks so much for having me. I'm just going to uh, talk from some slides. So I'm gonna turn on my uh, screen share now. Um, can everyone see that? Yes? Looks good. Great. Okay. Uh, so my talk is called um, Poverty and Structural Injustice in and Beyond Kant's Theory of Right. And let me just get started. So my main uh, question of this project is basically, um, is poverty unjust? And if so, should governments try to alleviate poverty through redistributive taxation? And my aim today is to try to sympathetically reconstruct Kant's answers to these questions in the Doctrine of Right. I think, I mean, he doesn't say a lot about uh, poverty, but I think that what he does say actually contains quite a compelling uh, justification of a w w welfare state but the remarks he makes are as brief as they are uh, elliptical. Um, on one, I think, widely accepted interpretation, and one I'm going to try to challenge a little bit, Kant thinks that poverty is unjust because it leads to what you might call the interpersonal domination of poor people by rich people. And what I'm going to argue, and what I'm going to argue, is that actually Kant locates the injustice of poverty in the fact that being poor is in a form of exclusion from what one might call the basic institutions of uh, society. So the upshot is that the wrong at stake is not best understood narrowly, uh, interpersonally, but as the theme would uh, suggest, as a structural or systemic problem. And what I'm going to try to claim is that the ultimate kind of point we can draw from Kant's brief uh, marks is that uh, any social order which in fact grants the right to private property must, on pain of inconsistency, also support programs for welfare. So to kind of put my point in a slogan, what justifies private property justifies its redistribution. So I think this, I think positioning Kant in this way allows him to make an interesting intervention in current debates about economic justice. And you might put the space of the debate very schematically as the following, you know, so you might think, uh, well, liberals are committed to the, both the ideal of freedom and the ideal of equality. But these, you know, as is well known, can seem to go in opposite ways. So emphasizing freedom, what you might call libertarians hold that economic redistribution, in fact, violates uh, our freedoms to use our property as we see fit. 
and emphasizing the equality poll, there's a certain kind of view that the state should redistribute re 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 whenever doing so helps maintain fair social cooperation. And you might think, you know, at the bottom, and this isn't just a question of philosophy, this is a question of uh, public policy. You might think at bottom are just two competing visions of what a society is. Is it, is it an association of cooperators as in brawls, or is it like an aggregate of disassociated individuals? And my thought is that Kant's political philosophy is actually interesting and exciting because it might offer a way to bring together the ideals of freedom and the ideals of equality. And key to this kind of reconciling move, I think, is Kant's understanding of freedom as, quote, independence from being constrained by another's choice. So how exactly to understand what Kantian independence is or is not, I'm starting to see that everything in a way sort of hangs on this uh, contested question. But in my brief time today, I'm not gonna argue for, uh, for my own particular interpretation, I'm just gonna state it. And it seems to me that Kantian independence is in fact constituted by a familiar set of negative rights to non-interference, i.e. protections of person, property, contract, certain kinds of domestic arrangements, which can only be realized through a state that interprets and enforces those rights in the name of all. So you might think that Kant's equation of freedom with negative rights, by freedom I mean independence here, might seem to place him squarely in the libertarian camp. And for a long time, he was in fact interpreted in this way. I'm starting to think actually now that, you know, that's not entirely wrong. And so what I'm gonna do for today is sort of stay with that interpretation uh, uh, as far as I, I, I possibly can. So, you know, it does seem like Kantian independence is mainly constituted through a set of negative protections, but Kant also holds that realizing independence requires a state with the authority to regulate and redistribute property, a central mandate of any kind of welfare state. So I think that understanding how Kant can incorporate egalitarian concerns within a freedom-based view may in fact help us see beyond the contemporary impasse. So you might think though, why, why Kant here and not say Marx over here, we have the young Karl, right? If one wants to understand poverty and structural injustice, why turn to a thinker who wrote before anyone truly understood the complex forms of domination and exploitation inherent in market societies? Why not turn instead to Marx or critical theory? And my own view, I'm not, I don't know if it's going to be <laughs> shared by everyone in here, know. but my own view is it's precisely because economic justice concerns are quite orthogonal to Kant's main project that one can actually learn something from what he does say about it. So I'm thinking that Kant's political philosophy is primarily preoccupied with the very abstract concern of how it's even possible for states to have legitimate authority over people. And as I've said, his answer tends to kind of move in the environment of the idea of protections of negative rights. So I actually think that all this is quite an inhospitable conceptual environment for thinking about distributive justice. But so then it becomes especially important that if poverty relief shows up even here, Kant seems to give us an argument that it's in fact tied to the basic um, functions of a legitimate state. Okay, so now on to the passage. It's a passage I've spent now many, many years uh, concerned about. It's, you know, it's, it's, there's times where I think, how can I make so much of one passage? But, you know, here we are. So here's one of the few places where uh, Kant in the Doctrine of Rights specifically talks about the issue that I'm concerned with. He says, to the supreme commander, there belongs indirectly 
That is, insofar as he has taken over the duty of the people, the right to impose taxes on the people for its own preservation. These taxes include support for organizations providing for the poor, foundling homes, and church organizations, usually called charitable or pious institutions. And now here's the argument, and I think it's a particularly dense argument even by the standards of Kant's political thought. So he says, the general will of the people has united itself into a society, which is to maintain itself perpetually. And for this end, it has submitted itself to the internal authority of the state in order to maintain those who are unable to maintain themselves. For reasons of state, the government is therefore authorized to constrain the wealthy, those who have means, to provide the means of sustenance to those who are unable to provide for even their most necessary natural needs. The wealthy have acquired an obligation to the commonwealth since they owe their existence to an act of submitting to its protection and care, which they need in order to live. On this obligation, the state now bases its right to contribute what is theirs to maintaining their fellows in citizens. This can be done either by imposing a tax on the property or commerce of citizens or by establishing funds and using the interest from them, not for the needs of the state, but for the needs of the people. Okay, so that's the argument. Lots of questions should emerge from it. First, what exactly does Kant mean by society? Is this just a way of pointing the, to the political institutions of the state, or is he referring more broadly to the economic and domestic spheres? Two, why exactly, and this is the kind of main one, I mean, why exactly does Kant think that poverty seems to impede the well functioning of society? Third, if a duty to take care of the poor falls on the people as a whole, why is it those of means alone that must bear it? Kant says that the healthy, quote, owe their existence to the commonwealth's protection and care, but isn't this true of everyone, both affluent and poor? So before we can make any headway, I'm not going to pretend to be able to answer all of these, but I'll say a little bit about all of them. We have to address the prior issue of why the Kantian state has the right to tax in the first place. So here's the puzzle again. Kant's political philosophy is based on the principle of freedom as independence. As he says, freedom must be the principle and indeed the condition for any exercise of coercion. So if that's the case, then the ideal of freedom as independence must justify the state's right to tax. Many commentators therefore interpret Kant as holding that poverty is a wrongful, is a form of wrongful dependence of the poor on the itch which redistributive taxation can correct. Now, some version of this interpretation is surely correct, I think but it's far from obvious how it's consistent with political philosophy, uh, with Kant's political philosophy as a whole. And here's the problem. Dependence for Kant is not about material interests. So for example, it's obviously true that uh, poor people often have no choice but to enter into unfavorable labor arrangements with those of means or to resort to private charity. But I don't think dependence for Kant is best understood in this material way. It's really about rights. <laughs> And Kant understands person, a person's rights quite narrowly in terms of a person's entitlement to control what she already has, i.e. her body and her property. Kant, I think, is as adamant as any contemporary libertarian that the condition of poverty is not a violation of such rights. Not having enough to thrive is not having the same as not having control over what is already one's own. So here's another restatement of the puzzle. What's puzzling is that Kant seems to be committed to the following inconsistent claims. The state should alleviate poverty. The state only exists to realize freedom as independence. Freedom as independence is the protection of people's rights. 
poverty doesn't violate people's rights. So it seems hard to see how you can hold all these. Key to the resolution, I take it, is that in his remarks on poverty, Kant is working towards a conception of systemic dependence, i.e. dependence that is not reducible to the violation of one person's rights by another. So even if four is true and poverty is not a violation of anyone's rights, it may still represent a failure in the functioning of us. System of rights. By that, I mean, as a first approximation, the totality of the rights individuals have against one another, plus the institutional conditions that people need in order to actually exercise those rights in a concrete social world. So, to give an example, if we don't have rules of the road, nobody could exercise their right to free movement. Analogously, I'm going to claim Kant thinks that without welfare protections, people can't fully exercise their right to own. Okay. In order to make sense of any of this, we need to say a little bit about what property is, because for Kant, the idea of poverty depends on the idea of property. As he says, if none might appropriate more of this world's goods than his neighbor, there would be no rich folk, but also no poor. So I wanna draw from this three claims that he's making. First, it seems to me that what this sentence says is that poverty is a comparative notion. So a single person stranded on a desert island without decent shelter or adequate food is clearly deprived but she's not necessarily poor, right? So to be for someone to be poor, there has to be someone who's not poor. I take it. Uh, second, if nobody owned anything, nobody would be poor. So that means that the relation between rich and poor that defines poverty is normative and not merely descriptive. To be poor is to lack the authority to take or use what one needs. Third, there's no poverty without accumulation. So if people were allowed to own but not to accumulate, no one would have the right to control the things that others need to survive. So let me just say a little bit about how I understand Kant's two-step account of property, drawing here on uh, work I've done elsewhere. So I take it that the big idea is something like the following. You have to think of a right, as Kant says, as a moral capacity to put another under an obligation. So if you think of a right in that sense, a property right is thus a moral capacity, you might call it a normative power, to put others under an obligation to forbear from using a particular thing unless one grants them permission to do so. So what this means is that in order to understand the moral capacity of, to own, one needs to understand two things. The meaning of this capacity, what is property, and the conditions needed to exercise it, i.e. how does one get property. So I think Kant's theory of property proceeds in two steps. The first treats, as Kant says, how to have something external as one's own. Step two treats how to, how to acquire anything external. I'm not gonna say a whole lot about having, I'm happy to talk about it more in the Q&A. But in step one, I think it Kant argues that persons do in fact have the moral power to own things. What that means to say that individuals have this power is to say, just to say that interfering with their things counts as wronging them. Kant's highly compressed argument for this claim is expressed as the postulate of practical reason with regard to rights. Like all things in Kant, there's a lot of disputes about how to interpret it. Again, I'd be happy to say more in the Q&A. So I'm not gonna say much about having. Acquiring brings the important stuff for the purpose of this paper. Kant's gonna argue that the moral power to own depends on the state to be rightfully exercised. So the state provides the conditions under which the right to own can be applied to determinate objects in the world through acts of acquisition. And I'm taking here that essential argument for this claim is what you might call the unilateralism problem, which is the idea that there's no way to make anything mine consonant with the freedom of everyone else 
outside of a state that constructs and enforces a regime of property law. If each of us is in charge of ourselves, no one could have the authority just on their own to force another to keep off what they've claimed as their own. The state, I'm taking it, solves the unilateral problem by creating the conditions of reciprocity through which individual acts of acquisition can be made consistent with the freedom of all. So the upshot here is that what seems to be a set of distinct acts, your acquiring and my inquiring, has to be understood as a thing we do together. So trying to acquire all on your own is trying to dance the, is like trying to dance the tango by yourself. What follows from this account of how the movement from having to acquiring happens? Well, it follows, I think, from this that all private property is in some sense under the control of the state. Kant says the state is supreme proprietor or lord of the land. Uh, this does not mean that the state owns everything. In fact, it doesn't own anything, but it does mean that the state can decide who owns what and impose restrictions and regulations on the use of private property. What does this say about our question about redistributive taxation? It says the following, this two-step account says the following, the concept of property makes no reference to the needs of other people. As long as owning a thing does not interfere with anyone else's ownership, it's perfectly okay. So what property is for Khan is exclusive ownership without sensitivity to the needs of others. So if freedom as independence justifies dominion, ownership as dominion, the exercise of this power can only be modified if we have some sort of problem of freedom as independence. So what that means is that the Kantian state cannot suddenly introduce principles of collective welfare as a reason for redistributive taxation. It can only do so if the, every, if the generations of everyone's right to acquire generate some sort of unfreedom as an outcome. But what exactly is the lack of freedom at issue here? The puzzle about dependence returns. So on the count I wanna put forward, poverty is a form of systemic injustice. The poor are probably de problematically dependent on a system or structure of property rights. But so what does it mean for a person, a group of persons to, defend, to depend on a structure? Here's an illuminating, but I think partial answer. Here's one argument. The state needs to represent everyone's will. The state cannot do so if it leaves some interpersonally dependent on the wills of others, i.e. dominated by them. Poverty, like slavery, is a form of interpersonal domination. Just as the slave is dominated by a master, so the poor person is dominated by a rich person. No one can rationally consent to their own interpersonal domination. So you can only consent to a property protecting state if it avoids interpersonal domination through redistributive taxation. This is basically the view put forward by Arthur Epstein in Force and Freedom. I won't read the whole quote. I just wanna point out that, so he, so he says, a slave does not share a united will. The same relations of dependence can arrive through a series of rightful actions. The problem of poverty is exactly that. The poor are completely subject to the choice of those in more fortunate circumstances. I think the problem with this account is that for Kant, the relation between the master and slave and between poor and rich cannot be the same relation of dependence at all. On the Kantian framework, the poor person is not dominated by those with means. The affluent person just does what they see fit with their own property, thereby putting the poor in a bad state. So unless the rich actually took from the poor what was already theirs, the analogy between slavery and poverty fails. So I'm in the last part of my talk now. How am I doing for time? Okay, here's where I wanna go. So considering the following kind of very real case, a person cannot afford rent on a, on a suitable apartment, or they can scrape by sometimes and not in others. So they're a permanent threat of homelessness or eviction. 
Because of that, because I mean, say they're evicted, they have no stable place to come to, to return to at night, which makes it hard to honor an agreement to show up to their job on time. Without steady employment, they can't fulfill their legal obligations to provide adequate sh um, shelter and food for their dependents. They turn to crime, get caught, consequently lose the right to vote, at least for a while. So what you see from an example like this that you can you know, read about all over the place is that poverty has cascading effects, multiplying sites of exclusion, not only from ownership, but also from property contract status and thereby also from the public order itself. Note that a person can find themselves in a situation like this without anyone having violated their rights, at least on the Kantian understanding of rights. But it's also true that the forms of disadvantage that they undergo are not the effects of nature, but of human arrangements. So my own view in thinking about what Kant could be talking about, what it would mean to think of poverty as a form of structural inclusion, exclusion involves, let's go back to the power of ownership. Let's think more about the power of dominion, the right to do what I want with the thing. Well, one thing that involves is the right to exchange, right? I mean, one thing paradigmatically owners do with their properties, exchange it. But the practice of exchange necessitates an elaborate physical and institutional infrastructure, the introduction of money, courts to enforce contract, police to ensure safe transits of goods, and so on. So in some sense, if this is all going to be done on terms of independence, free markets require a state which creates the conditions for the effective exercise of property rights. Note that if we lacked state-controlled markets, the problem would not be that individual property owners necessarily violate each other's right to exchange things. The problem would be that no one could exchange, engage in the rightful practice of exchanging what is theirs. So the state needs to act to make sure that people can actually exercise their rights. I think this is key. So to go back to the puzzle, three. Two of the conditions that generated the puzzle was that freedom as independence is the protection of people's rights and poverty doesn't violate people's rights. What this brief discussion of market infrastructure shows is that the notion of protection at work in step three is broader than just preventing or punishing the violations of rights. Protection involves creating conditions for people to exercise their rightful powers. And I'm thinking that although poverty doesn't violate people's rights on the Kantian understanding, it does show state failure to create these conditions. So final, here's my example, cash-free commerce. This is just an example to illustrate a broader point. Suppose one's community has instituted a policy of cash-free commerce. A lot of people enjoy it, efficiency, lower theft, et cetera. But this is a, a statistic in 2017, 18% of the US population was underbanked. So if you have a community that's gone, let's say all cash free, you might ask, can the underbanked meaningfully participate in the commercial economy of the cash free world? In fact, according to one <laughs> estimate, the ability that a lot of us have to use our <laughs> credit cards leads to almost to $1,000 a year in transfers from poorer households to more affluent ones. This is because merchants pass on the bank fees associated with cards onto consumers in the form of higher prices, which are borne by those uh, paying with cash and offset by those paying with credit cards for with rewards. So the person in line at the store who pays with the credit card doesn't wrong the underbanked person with only cash. But I think there is a condition of structural injustice here, very close, I think, to what Kant calls general injustice, which again, I'd be happy to talk more about. So in these, what I, what I would sort of urge Kantians to do in thinking about um, the Kantian state and its uh, the role that it can play in the economy is you got to think more about cases like these and not cases about of clear interpersonal domination. <laughs>
Final slide. Okay, so what are the limits? I've tried to make the best case that Kant's uh, articulation of, of, of the problem of poverty and the need for redistributive taxation is intelligible, is consistent with his political project. But I think we also need to be pretty upfront about what it does and doesn't do. First, I don't think Kant thinks that inequality is intrinsically unjust. He's not especially concerned with the gap between the rich and the poor per se. I think he thinks inequality is instrumentally bad when and only when it, it impedes freedom as independence. Two, and this is a claim I, I argue more in the paper, Kant's remarks on poverty, you know, take care of people's necessary natural needs, seem to be concerned with destitution and the denial of basic needs. You might ask, shouldn't justice be concerned more broadly with all the goods that people need to meaningfully participate in a public life? Third, and I think this is close to the second, Kant's idea of exclusion is literally being able to unown things. Shouldn't we understand the idea of social exclusion more broadly in terms of feelings of alienation from the productive life of society? You might also ask if the problem of poverty is exclusion from property, why not the widespread dispersal of property throughout society? All these three points draw on things said by both Hegel and Rawls. So I don't want to discount these criticisms, but there does seem to me value in developing a limited form of egalitarianism that begins from premises about freedom that even a libertarian might accept. Given that we exist in a political world in which liberal states are massively denying citizens' basic needs, showing what demands of economic justice may follow from an individualistic, even quasi-libertarian starting point may not be a pointless exercise. Thanks. Excellent. Thank you. I'll clap for everybody. Okay, great. So we're back and this is the second part of our session on Kant on structural domination. And we're happy to have Jordan Pasco from Manhattan College on Kant, labor and intersectional structural justice. Welcome, Jordan. Yeah. Thank you. So like Rafiq, I am going to um, share my screen. And uh, yes. All right, here we go. Um, take you through some slides to walk you through the argument. So I'm, I'm really pleased to be here and especially pleased to be um, in conversation with Rafiq. Um, so uh, in this paper, I explore how Kant's theory of labor um, allows us to think beyond and between and scholarship illuminating elements of Kant's political arguments with implications for contemporary Kantian and feminist scholarship, as well as for debates about Kant's theories. Um, and these arguments are designed to highlight the role of structural domination in Kant's practical philosophy. Um, so the problem uh, that brought me to this um, was that as race and gender have moved towards the center separately of Kantian uh, scholarship over the course of the last decade, um, they've remained strikingly distinct with work on sex and gender taking up Kant's discussions of sex, marriage, caregiving, and citizenship, and work on race and racism focusing on his anthropological, geographical, cosmopolitan texts. And while this has led to an emerging discourse on the difficulty of intersectional approaches to Kant, um, uh, it often reflects Kant's own careful insistence on categorical thinking. So my question is, you know, what do intersectional Kantian methodologies look like and how can they help us address and identify patterns of structural domination in Kant? So I want to argue that intersectional analyses of Kant must begin by taking up the problem of structural domination in Kant's practical philosophy, for example, by attending to the structural patterns of inequality embedded in his account of right. So to do this, I build on recent work developing the role of non-ideal theory in Kant's uh, political work. And I offer Kantian's resources for attending to the intersectional political economy embedded in his account of right. Tracking this problem requires new strategies within Kantian scholarship to think beyond single axis frameworks of oppression. 
Um, so these are sort of my goals for today. Um, uh, and my proposal here is that Kant's theory of labor offers us a systemic analysis of his social theory through which we can begin to think intersectionally. So obviously the first, the first question I have to address here is, right, does Kant have a theory of labor? Um, I wanna argue that he does. And I'm gonna take you through a very shorthanded way of getting to Kant's theory of labor. Um, the full this argument has been published by Cambridge, and I can put a link in the comments um, later since it is it is freely and openly available through the end of this week. So, um, so Kant's theory of labor right, emerges out of his account of private right, his distinction between rights to things and rights against person and kind. He then suggests that if there are rights to things and rights against persons, maybe there are rights against things or rights to persons. And then he says, no, you can't have rights against things. That's not possibly a category, but it does seem like you can have rights to persons, right? Which he calls a right to a person akin to the right to a thing. Now, when Kant publishes this argument in um, the Doctrine of Right in February of 1787, one of his reviewers, Friedrich Butherweck, remarks, that um, our jurists and philosophers will be surprised by this, but Mr. Kant contends there's actually a third, namely a personal right to a thing, is or what it's supposed to be will surprise many even more than the new idea itself. So the innovative third right that Buderweck identifies here is this right to a person akin to the right to a thing, the structure of right that Kant says organizes the domestic sphere within private right. Now, much has been written about this um, in terms of Kant's theory of marriage, but I want to, to think about it a little bit more broadly, since it was recognized as a key innovation, not only by Kant's critics, but by Kant himself, who responds to Buderweck's review by publishing um, the appendix to the doctrine of right, um, where he elaborates on this third form of right. He calls it a new phenomenon in the juristic sky and reflects on its historical emergence, asking whether it is a Stella Mirabilis, right, a phenomenon never seen before, um, or merely a shooting star. So he himself is working on this question of like how innovative this claim is. So um, this leads to develop what he his trend argument drafts for the doctrine of right, um, which is, is organized into this argument for property right, contract, domestic right to a person akin to the right to a thing as the three forms of right that constitute private right. right. Um, uh, and so um, what I want to argue here is that Kant's trichotomy argument is also a labor argument. Um, and so it, it breaks down something like this. Um, it helps us to identify the distinct forms of labor, dependency, and erasure that organize Kant's account of citizenship and the public sphere, while at the same time recognizing Kant's innovative account of the emerging bourgeois household. So, um, so property right here corresponds to a person who owns the product of their labor, right? He describes the, um, the wig maker for example, the wig that he has made, and so he owns the product of his labor. Um, contract right, the person who contracts out their labor so that the product of that labor belongs to somebody else, like the barber. Um, and then third, um, domestic right, or a person who um, takes on the ends, right, who agrees to take on the ends of the head of the household as if they were their own. Um, so if we understand domestic right as much like the other two, a form of, of labor right, um, we can see the distinction here. While an employer has rights against those he employs contract, a householder has rights to his wife, children, and servants, although these rights too are, like all property rights, um, really rights against everybody else. So domestic rights are special in that they are exclusive, right? Kant says marriage must be monogamous. Parents have special duties to care for their children and household employers may retrieve their servants who run away thanks to the special right to them. Um, and so this corresponds to, a, a, so this labor argument corresponds to an argument 
bit about rights and about ends. So the independent laborer, the person who owns the product of their labor, sets their own ends and therefore has civil independence, right? They are self-sufficient in this project of setting their own ends, setting, pursuing their own ends. A dependent laborer, someone who contracts out their labor, aligns the relevant ends, the ends relative to their labor, uh, with those of their employer. While a domestic uh, servant or a wife takes the ends of the head of the household as their own, right? Um, and so this is what Kant means when he says that within the household persons possess one another as they were things but make use of one another as persons. He's describing a condition in which people come into possession of one another's ends. This is similar to, but distinct from the ways in which the contract laborer aligns his ends with those of his employer. Um, while the contract laborer can act as if his employer's ends were his own to represent those ends, for example, in trade, um, members of the household take household ends as their own, transforming their own ends accordingly. So within the household, wives and servants are empowered to make use of their reason and their skill in fulfilling these ends. Um, and so this dynamic also sets limits on the kinds of ends that wives and servants can have, since these ends must remain consistent with the ends of the household. In Kant's day, the debate over the rights of servants to marry was one example of this, and Kant's own vitriolic response to his manservant Lampa getting married without his permission reveals the degree to which he understood servants as having duties not to set ends that might conflict with the ends of the household. So this duty to share ends clarifies Kant's claim that wives and servants must remain passive citizens since they cannot behave as if they were independent. And so this argument about labor is also an argument about citizenship and the political and political standing within the state. Um, uh, so this relation of exclusivity within the domestic sphere explains Kant's uncompromising exclusion of wives, children, and servants from the public sphere. While a waged employee, a contract laborer in the middle here, might deploy public reason in the public sphere as if he were independent, the domestic servant, the wife and the child are exclusively dependent on the master, the husband or the father. There's no way to treat them as if they were independent. Um, and so since there's no contractual limit on the kind or amount of labor that is entailed by these domestic uh, uh, labor relations, um, the domestic servant and the wife cannot behave as if they were independent since they've adopted the household's ends as their own. And so this can help us understand why, why women are excluded from both voting and public reason on Kant's account. Domestic relations, including contracts for domestic labor, establish a relation of dependency that precludes access to the public sphere. This is an enclosed dependence organized through shared ends so that dependents cannot behave as if they are independent. So this, I think, gives us a critical distinction within the category of um, passive citizenship here. Um, so we have passive citizens who are our laborers, right, who are able still to participate in public reason and public debate. They can't vote, but they can still participate and they have the ability to work their way up. And then we have domestic laborers and wives who Kant says cannot work their way up. Um, and they are passive citizens who also cannot participate in, in public reason or public debate precisely because they don't have ends of their own given the, the nature of relations within the household. So taken together, these three arguments about labor correspond to this trichotomy structure of right that Kant lays out, um, through which Kant theorizes here, not merely public and private realms, but public market and domestic realms, each with its own, its own distinctive set of labor patterns. Mm -hmm. um, and so I wanna argue here that in theorizing the domestic labor, 
the domestic sphere and domestic labor rigorously in this way, Kant provides us with a crucial dimension of thinking about labor relations that's actually lacking in Marx as well as in Locke and in others. Um, he's identifying the economic role of the household at a critical historical moment as the bourgeois household coalesces as a necessary site of unwaged labor to support the reproduction of the burgeoning global capitalist market. So in this sense, I want to argue that Kant's trichotomy argument is absolutely um, right a new phenomenon in the juristic sky, as he himself puts it. So this takes me to Kant's argument about active and passive citizenship, which we've arrived at here. Kant's theory of labor organizes his account of active and passive citizenship, a distinction made rightful, he argues, by the possibility that each can work his way up from an active, from a passive condition to an active one. Um, I argue that Kant's each can work his way up argument offers a starting point for examining structural domination within his political philosophy. Kant's theory of labor defines the political public spheres as the main of the materially independent or those who can speak as if are materially independent. The labor relevant to these spheres is the skilled labor of the artisan, the scholar, the public servant, and the intellectual labor of public reason. But Kant's reliance on domestic labor to structure the distinction between active and passive citizenship ensures that while it might be the case that anyone can work their way up, it is possible for everyone to work their way up, since someone would still have to do the dependent labor. So if a given factory worker opens a textile shop, right, and becomes an active citizen, someone else will have to take her place on the factory floor. As women work outside the household as professors, lawyers, wig makers, and public servants, they outsource domestic and reproductive labor to others who thereby become dependent. Kant's account of civil equality then is embedded within a broader pattern of structural inequality, right, with an escape hatch for individuals, but not a general project to, to get everybody to a point of active participation. Um, so, uh, Kant's labor hierarchy maps rightful class distinctions organized through labor rather than hereditary privilege, which marks a historical transition from the aristocratic to the meritocratic account of class relations. And as feminist Kantians have persistently pointed out, Kant's account of dependence is not merely classed, but it is also gendered, and I mean to show here that it is raced as well. Kantians have debated whether this argument reflects Kant's intractable woman problem, um, uh, or whether it's just a highly gendered institutional order in which wives are dependent on husbands. Um, and these arguments suggest that while class distinctions might be rightful, as long as one can work their way up, when these distinctions turn on a um, permanent feature of one's identity, like gender or race, then they would seem to violate basic Kantian principles of equality and innate right. And so Kantian feminists have often argued for a better Kantianism, which must be committed to the premise that anyone, women included, can work their way up from an active um, condition to, uh, from a passive condition to an active one. But here's the problem. We can imagine, as feminist Kantians often do, that women may work their way up by becoming householders or obtaining positions that otherwise make them independent. But this argument often takes relations within the household to be organized through personal dependency rather than, as Rafiq has often put it, through structural dependency. Kant's trichotomy argument is a critical and underexamined feature of his political philosophy, which reveals the way that a gender division of labor the gender organizers have dependence in the Kantian state. Oh, I think this should unsettle feminist treatments, um, familiar feminist treatments of Kant's account of the right to a person akin to the right to a thing, which have overwhelmingly focused on marriage, and it should open space to examine the interlinked forms of domestic labor that shape Kantian and liberal conceptions of independence and citizenship. And of course, under global capitalism, then and now, this gender division of labor becomes, through outsourcing, a racialized division of labor. And this is borne out in common antithetical lecture, um, where just self-actualized. So 
for example, Friedlander letters, which are some of the apology left in the 1770s, Kant argues, if one takes unrefined nations, then the woman is not at all to be distinguished from the man. She does not have the charms which she has in the developed state, and she must work by, the, by strength in just the same way as the man. And so for this reason, Kant insists, we can only study humanity rather than the female sex in the unrefined state, since there is no difference in the character of the man and the woman in this state, as he puts it. Uh, instead, the development of proper womanhood, uh, in other words, white womanhood, is what makes the state refined. It's an achievement of whiteness generated through the proper gendered organization of labor, by which he means specifically the domestic sphere, which he identifies in his anthropological lectures as a critical feature of civilization. He calls it the favorable condition under which the refinement of women's proper nature can occur. Um, and he argues, too, that the proper structure of this domestic sphere is also critical. He argues here um, that in Asian societies, uh, uh, he says, where the society of men is unrefined, this is because women lack equal authority within the home. So in other words, the domestic sphere is improperly organized. Um, and he argues that holding women in contempt in these cultures is a sign of a lack of refinement. And so I, I point to all of this, this anthropological evidence, and there's a great deal more of it in the full version of the argument, as a way of making the claim that for Kant, gender is always race, and proper gender is an achievement of whiteness produced through the proper deployment of structural domination, through the proper division of labor within the domestic sphere. And this is then combine Kant's con both apologies in the draft of the doctor, right? Um, that the proper constitution of the domestic sphere includes outsourcing the non-sexual labors of the household if the husband is rich enough, so that the wife is not troubled to assist with matters of domestic well-being, as he puts it. And so this puts white bourgeois womanhood as the um, proper performance of womanhood that is undergirded by this practice of outsourcing. So what does this outsourcing look like? Well, Kant's trichotomy argument in which he distinguishes between contract and domestic was the culmination of a decades long set of reflections on the organization of work. His account of the household as a domestic society comprised of marital, parental, and master-servant relations was inspired by Gottfried Achenwald's account in Natural Law, which served as the textbook for his lectures on political philosophy in the 1770s and 1780s. And in those notes, as well as in his Feyerabend lectures uh, of 1784, we find Kant struggle to distinguish permissible labor relations, like marriage and servitude, from impermissible ones like slavery and sex work. Kant's consideration of sex work, for example, troubles the limits of contract labor. Um, and he examines the problem of slavery. Repeatedly, he mentions marriage as the sole exception to this problem. These early notes reveal the close linkages between Kant's conception of the dependency of slavery and the dependency of domestic relations and the inadequacies of existing frameworks for delineating permissible relations within the domestic sphere and for developing then definitive arguments against enslavement. Kant clarifies his position on slavery not by distinguishing it from servitude or from contract labor, but by distinguishing it from marriage. He struggles to show why marriage is the single exception to the impermissibility of contracts to make use of another person. And so he invents this right to a person akin to the right to a thing in order to transform, in order to transform and distinguish his account of marriage from his account of slavery. Um, it allows him to show that household relations do not require wives and domestic servants to dispose of themselves as things, and therefore to definitively claim that those relations where people do dispose of themselves as things, in other words, sex work and slavery, um, have no place in a proper scheme of right. This link between Kant's account of marriage and slavery um, first of all, gives us some tools in intersectional analyses of Kant, and it also allows us to complicate established narratives about Kant's conception of race and slavery. While Kant was justifying race-based slavery in his anthropology through the late 1780s, he was also grappling with critiques of slavery as a form of labor in his work on 
domestic labor and marriage. Um, and so this may offer an alternative explanation for Kant's apparent change of mind about race in the final decade of his career. Since Kant continues to publish on race in the 1790s, it's possible that it's a shift in his views on rightful labor relations, namely his invention of the framework of the right to a person akin to the right to a thing, um, generate the final reduction of slave doctrine of perpetual peace rather than his views on this. This framework in hand, Kant is finally able to articulate the distinction between marriage and sex work and between domestic servitude and slavery, which allowed him to clearly ground for the first time an argument against slavery as inconsistent with right. However, Kant's argument against slavery is also an argument for the enclosed dependency of domestic right. Just as marriage is posed as the rightful alternative to sex work, it is domestic labor that is marked as slavery's other rather than contract labor. Um, Kant's discussion of the impossibility of slavery and the doctrine of right is organized explicitly to justify other forms of dependency, namely to distinguish the impermissible right to persons as things from the permissible and in fact rightful right to persons akin to the rights to things in the domestic sphere, and to distinguish wrongful slavery from the rightful contracts that organize day labor and tenancy, from the forms of holding that arise when one takes a convict, a convict on as a bondsman, and from rightful carceral slavery, which he continues to defend all the way through the doctrine of right. If slavery is abolished from the category of rightful labor in the doctrine of right, its variations like unwaged labor, indebted labor, indentured labor, penal labor configured as convict lease labor, sharecropping labor, domestic labor need not be. And so as Kant develops his rightful frame for enclosed domestic labor, in other words, the right to a person akin to the right to a thing, he carves out a space between enslavement and wage labor, a category that protects the exclusivity of independence and abstract equality while ensuring ongoing entitlement to the labor that reproduces this independence. These patterns of dependency shape political participation and public reason in Kant's arguments in the doctrine of right. Just as the abolition of slavery justified new forms of enclosed dependent labor, and this speaks to Dustin's question in the last hour, Kant's theory of labor can help us track the implication of these emergent patterns of dependency, including how race and gendered exclusions from public participation, public reason are normed and enforced, ensuring the resilience of white patriarchal conceptions of justice. Thus, as Kanye tend to obstacles whiteism off development of this, country of labor provides a critical lens for mapping strategies of political exclusion. Enclosed dependent labor shapes not only exclusion from public welfare programs, but from public reason as well, since those who engage in enclosed dependent labor cannot, as we've seen, reason as if they were independent. And so Kant's account of rightful enclosed dependent labor organizes patterned political exclusion so that public reason remains white reason as well as male reason. And this in turn ensures that the patterned inequalities embedded in this framework cannot be adequately scrutinized by public reason itself. So this gets me to the last piece of this puzzle um, where I develop an account of Kantian intersectionality. So I've argued that when we attend to the labor practices that undergird Kant's conception of independence and maturity, it's apparent that access to caregiving and reproductive labor is an essential feature of independence. Entitlement to this is justified on insistence that anyone can work way up. In the 70s, this was a liberty claim, and standing was limited by neither birth nor class, naming labor as the mechanism for advancement. But Kant's theorization of labor was nevertheless informed by his anthropological, geographical, and historical arguments, which assumed white male entitlement to this right to work one's way up and elided the ways that his theories of race and gender justified and enforced permanent patterns of dependence. So Kant's arguments about domestic labor can help us to identify these fractal patterns elaborated from strategies 
strategies practiced within the household, which generate this enclosed dependent uh, labor, all the way through what Arlie Hothschild has called a global care chain, which tracks the privatized outsourcing of domestic labor. Both locally and globally, these produce care drains as caregiving labor shortages then emerge at the bottom of this care chain, producing race and class patterns of vulnerability and dependency since the support of caregiving labor is then unavailable in the communities at the bottom of this care drain. Thus, although Kant provides us with no explicit account of women of color within his theory of right, we can find an implicit account of the intersecting roles of race and gender dependency in his argument for this right to work one's way up. Kant's assurance that political inequality is consistent with abstract equality is structured remarkably similarly to what Kimberly Crenshaw has called a but-for argument, which prioritizes those who are privileged but for their race or their gender. And here's the, the um, Crenshaw's uh, analogy here that I'm going to rely on for those of you unfamiliar with it. This is Crenshaw's basement analogy, um, which is developed in the same paper where she develops Interestingly, describes oppression basement, right, with, a, with people standing in the basement on each other's shoulders. There's a hat top, and anybody facing only a single point of discrimination can climb through that hatch, but they are standing on the shoulders of others who face more and more points of discrimination. So, uh, Arguments focused on gender discrimination that argue that women can work their way up, right, through that little basement hatch, um, uh, while arguments focused on race discrimination insist that the liberation of the Black community, for example, turns on the ability of Black men to work their way up. But my analysis of Kant's theory of labor um, shows that claims that individual wives or servants can work their way up does not produce an argument for eradicating domestic or dependent labor. Instead, it shifts that labor down the care chain, which can be understood in light of Crenshaw's basement analogy as you know, passing it down the people standing on each other's shoulders. So Kant's account of domestic labor reveals how political oppression and economic exploitation co-constitute one another, challenging Kant's assertion that the right to a person akin to the right to a thing is voluntary in ways that make it fully right. Rather, we might get as more akin to what Nancy Fulton has called the cooperation of reproductive labor. This captures the cooperative dimension that Kant's account emphasizes, the reproductive rights, the shared ends, the quasi-contractual basis of such relations. But it also draws our attention to the ways in which, if dependent labor is a necessary feature of a political order, then economic, institutional, social, and cultural coercion will operate to ensure ongoing access to this dependent labor. This may look like the discriminatory hiring practices that kept Black men and women out of forms of labor with benefits, unions, and good wages, and thus kept them tied to the dependency of domestic and agricultural labor from Reconstruction through the New Deal. It may look like immigration policies that create a migrant underclass concentrated in domestic, agricultural, and other informal labor markets. And it may look like the designations of essential or key workers in a pandemic that ensured that in the U.S. more than 50 percent of caregivers giving and service labor deemed essential was performed by women of color, which exacerbated the inequitable impacts of COVID-19 within communities of color and revealed the deep precarity of workers in these fields. So the race and gendered impact of the pandemic, about which we've all heard much, reveal both the necessity of juridical and philosophical frameworks for attending systemically to domestic and caregiving labor, and the critical need for intersectional methodologies in theorizing the distribution of caregiving and its attendant patterns of vulnerability through patterns of coerced cooperation. When we understand Kant's theory of labor to include a careful theorization of the domestic and to be informed 
by his theorization, not only of race and gender, but of key structural linkages between them, then I think his analysis of labor may offer us some insights for addressing both of these problems. And so in this way, I identify Kant's theory of labor as a useful site for generating what Nancy Fulber has called an intersectional political economy, which, as she puts it, redefined the economic in ways that encompass both reproduction and social reproduction, including the creation of human capabilities and the social institutions that bind people into groups with at least some common ideas and interests, end quote. So, Thinking about Kant's race and gendered exclusions as co-produced through his accounts of labor and independence, ensure that we do not produce false categories of inclusion, such as assuming that women can just work their way up without attending to the racialized outsourcing of caregiving and reproductive labor at both the local and global levels in Kant's time and our own. So as we struggle to make Kantian philosophy accountable to intersectional and decolonial theorizing, which I think we should be doing, Kant's theory of labor provides us with a starting point for locating intersectional inequalities in Kant's thinking, for disrupting single axis thinking that continues to predominate in Kant's scholarship, and for identifying the structural forms of domination that are embedded in his practical philosophy. Thank you. Okay, excellent. Thanks very much. Um, 